Michael Hurst is the creator and producer of Billy the Kid. I'm Matt Noble at Gold Derby. And I wanted to ask you, Michael, what do you think is the most sort of special thing about this series? Uh, well, for me, the special thing is that it's about Billy the Kid, because when I was a, a kid myself, uh, growing up in, in the north of England, uh, for some reason, I, I was fixated on Billy. I, I, I hero worshipped Billy. When I was running to school as a seven or eight year old boy, I pretended that I or I imagined that I was riding a grey horse and being pursued by the sheriff's posse and, and I was Billy the Kid, you know. So uh, I discussed with the head of uh, Epics, Michael Wright, what he asked me what I would like to do after Vikings. And I said, curiously enough, I'd like to do a Western. And, um, you know, even though I am from the north of England and, and I'd like to do Billy the Kid in a sense, because I'd like to find out if he was worth hero worshipping. <laughs> uh, was he? Yes. I mean, he uh, he's a complicated person, but most of the things you think you know about Billy the Kid, you don't know. Um, you know, he, he it, normally I haven't seen that many representations of him on on other media and move, movies and so on. But generally speaking, you know, uh, there are just a lot of old tropes and cliches about you know he must have been a, a, a psychopathic killer, you know, a wild kid, a, a, you know, a criminal up to no good. Actually, when I did my research, what I found was much to my pleasure really, was that he was an extremely sensitive young man who'd been brought up by his Irish and very Catholic uh, mother. He had, who gave him his moral compass, that as he said himself, he was more sinned against than, than sinning. Uh, and who knew, you know, he had the most beautiful singing voice. He played musical instruments. He lit up every room he walked into and people who knew him well and rode with him loved him. Uh, so there was something special about Billy. So, I mean, it's true, he killed a, a, quite a number of people, but then if you're being pursued by bounty hunters, you usually do end up killing quite a few people. Yes. Uh, what, what about Billy's story did you want to tell through this series? Uh, well, the whole story, because I think that, um, so I wanted therefore to start from when he was a boy. Okay, so his, his Irish parents had been, had left Ireland because of the famine and ended up in New York, like a lot of Irish, but um, there were no jobs at that time. There were too many uh, immigrants in, in, in New York and they were forced to go west and, and uh, where the government, the American government had promised them jobs and opportunities and houses. And when they got there, there was nothing, you know, uh, when they got to the first place they went to was Kansas. They went to a place called uh, a town called Coffeeville. That had only been founded three years before they got there. So it wasn't a prosperous town. It was a building site. There were no jobs. There were no opportunities. And then Billy's father died. Um, they had to move on again. And it's very hard for his mother to bring up two young boys. And then his brother died of, of consumption. And then his mother died. So he had a very hard, very hard life in a very hard and, and, and violent place. So what I wanted to do though, was to put his myth in a kind of context, you know? I mean, he's that, you, you gotta think about it in one way, in this way, that how is it that a guy, a young man who died reputedly at the age of 21 in, you know, uh, the, in the Midwest, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the 19th century, he was just 21. How come that guy is still one of the most famous people in the Western world? I mean, it's, it's quite extraordinary. So I wanted to give context to that. And there's never been an authentic portrait of Billy before now. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to draw an authentic and dramatize an authentic picture of him and his life, why he did, what he did, how he ended up being an outlaw. And the fact that most of his life, his adult life, short though it was, 
was spent wanting to go straight and live a decent life. Um, and he wasn't allowed to, to do that. So, you know, I wanted to give him some justice, I guess. Oh, nice. And like you talked about how they started off in Kansas and like in some ways it is a bit of a nomadic show where, you know, different episodes will go to different parts of the West, whether that's Kansas or Texas or New Mexico. What's yeah. that like doing a show which like you are constantly changing the setting because you don't have the one town set that you can just be in every episode? Well, it's very challenging because we didn't have a studio. There was no need really for a studio. So uh, the production was on the road the whole time. So that, you know, when we did, when I did Vikings, I mean, we had a studio, a lot of the shots, a lot of the scenes were shot in the studio and we didn't have a studio. Everything was outside uh, on location. We built some, uh, to, uh, some of these crude early towns. Um, and, you know, that, but we had a wonderful production. We had a wonderful crew. Um, and what we also had, which was fantastic, both for me and for the young actors who were involved, was that we had a lot of real cowboys. Uh, you know, where they were in, in, in Canada uh, is a, a place famous for its rodeos and its cowboy uh, exhibitions and so on. So even though, you know, the, certainly the lead characters, you know, Australian and, and English and everything, they learned to ride. They thought they knew how to be a cowboy. And that was until they got to Canada when they actually met real cowboys and were gobsmacked, you know, at what they could do and found themselves uh, riding into stampedes with longhorn cattle, you know, escorted by, helped by, inspired by the cowboys who were all around them. And, and it, you know, it must have been so exciting for them. It, it was absolutely a wonderful experience for them. Oh, did, did you get to ride a horse, Michael, at any point during the filming of the show? I, you know what? The irony is I never actually got to Calgary. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well. Even though I'm the showrunner. <laughs> uh, and when I, we did Vikings, I was like commuting to Ireland where we shot that. But uh, the, the context was that when we began shooting, there was a two week quarantine mm -hmm. in Calgary. And uh, I would have been put up in a hotel for two or three weeks by the airport. Yeah. And I can't write in a hotel room. So mm -hmm. I, I thought, well, I better stay at home and wait for things to clear up. And while I was working from home, I was on Zoom with the producers and the actors and the production. And there was always some reason, like if I went out, even the, when the virus you know, abated to some extent, there was still a danger that I might catch uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. And if I caught COVID, I probably wouldn't be able to work at all. Mm -hmm. you know? So it was always slightly dangerous for me to Dangerous is probably a strong word, but it was a little risky for me to, at, at any one point, to go over that. And the truth was that it was working very well, that the system worked tremendously well. We had a wonderful producer, and it may be that, uh, you know, the, the actors and the directors uh, found it better that, uh, the, you know, that I wasn't stalking the sets every day. <laughs> And, uh, you know, not that I'm that kind of a showrunner, actually. Mm -hmm. I don't tell directors how to direct and I don't tell actors how to act. But, you know, part of my job as a showrunner is to be a part of a group who employ the heads of department and the directors and, and to choose the right people and then to give them the chance to do their best work and not to interfere with them. And we were blessed. We had, you know, Otto Barthes, who did Peaky Blinders, was our first director, a brilliant director, a great guy, and, and did one, the first two episodes were just wonderful. And then we had other directors, a female director, uh, a, a director I'd known on Vikings who was brilliant at um, action. Um, so we were, and of course, an, an amazing cast. It's, it's the first time I could genuinely say that 
it, they were universally good. The cast is universally good on Billy. And I think it's beautifully shot and realized. You know, I'm very proud of it, incredibly proud of it. As a showrunner that couldn't be on set, what was it like when you got sent or you saw that first piece of footage from what was happening over there? Uh, well, my first, I mean, the first thing was how, how, how striking and beautiful it looked. You know, I mean, that you're seeing things, as it were, through the director's uh, mm. eyes. And uh, it, it was wonderful. Um, we discussed early on that it was going to look somewhat different from other Westerns. So we refused to use all the, um, you know, the sets in Calgary that have been used again and again for Westerns and, and that you'll have seen again and again. And in the same way, for many Westerns, you see the same rock formations on screen, you see, you, and that's how you know it's a Western. And we wanted to get away from that. We wanted, you know, this was raw. This was very, a raw uh, America. This is America before the railroad gets there, you know, before these towns are established when the communities, when little towns perch on the edge of a vast wilderness. And that's the kind of sense that we wanted to create. And, and from the first shots that were sent to me, that was what they'd achieved. That's what was happening in front of my eyes. So it was very exciting. Mm. Also someone who's like put the words to the page, can't be there to see it sort of like, play out on set but then you get to watch watch it when it's done or or watch it after it's been filmed um what scene is the most special to you to have seen sort of realized and put together uh well this i have many many favorite scenes uh and of course i talk to the actors the principal actors uh, a, a lot and you know, as a result of that, one changes some of the dialogue or one, you know, one tries to play to their strengths or... Uh, um, but actually, the, the, the scene that I like best is the one, I think it's in uh, episode seven, which you may not have seen yet, I don't know, but, but Billy is asked to show his new employers some of his skills with a gun. And uh, by this time, he's already a wanted man, he's an outlaw. And as he says himself, I don't want to be famous for killing people, you know? And, uh, but anyway, he can't not do what his employers tell him to do. And they've set up a sort of shooting range, a shooting gallery uh, with, with lights and with bales of hay to catch the bullets and some targets. And there's an excited crowd of semi-drunken people to watch this, Billy showing off. And Billy doesn't want to do this at all. He doesn't want to do it. And so he just starts by, you know, picking off targets. And then he gets angrier and angrier because they're sort of applauding him and laughing and everything. And he suddenly blasts the whole place to smithereens. He fires his Winchester. He shoots out all the lights. He shoots out every, all the targets, all everything. He just, he's firing away, firing away. And of course the people suddenly go very quiet and they get nervous and frightened. And the guy who's hired him suddenly realizes that he might've done the wrong thing or he doesn't know, you know, what he didn't know what Billy was capable of. And he's hired someone who is very, very, very dangerous. So that's kind of, that's a, a transcending moment for Billy, but, uh, uh, but that's my favorite. But there are loads of wonderful moments, including, you know, Billy and his, the domestic, the intimate moments of Billy and his mom and, and uh, mm. you know, um, it's, it's a very intimate portrait in many ways. And Tom mm. Blythe, I think is just wonderful playing, playing Billy. He's absolutely amazing. Yeah, I, I spoke to him last week and boy, talking about that scene where his mother passes oh. away and and how uh, sort of sort of long that took to get right and how sort of he said, I think that was the most real acting experience he'd ever had. So yeah. that was really, yeah. Um, what, what for you, like 
you talked a bit about how the West, like you wanted this to be a different type of Western. What did you really want this show to say or maybe reveal that maybe hadn't been revealed by other Westerns in the past? Well, I wanted to do two things, I think. One was to be um, not in an oppressive way or, or, or a too loud a way, but I wanted it to be quite political because I discovered in my research that these organizations called the Rings, the Rings were self-selected groups of rich white Americans, males, mm -hmm. who uh, were gathered together largely secretly, but, but uh, were, their aim was to corrupt everything. <laughs> they bought everything. They bought sheriffs, they bought politicians, they bought farmers, they bought entrepreneurs. They corrupted the whole system and they were uh, very, very strong in, in New Mexico, but they were strong everywhere and, and their power was, uh, was almost limitless and people couldn't stand in their way because they literally would get shot, especially in, in New Mexico, especially in the, the West. And, um, and Billy ends up actually uh, initially working for someone who's high up in the Santa Fe ring, which was one of the biggest and oldest established uh, rings. Um, and these rings were responsible also at the time for throwing Mexican farmers off their farms and replacing them with, with uh, Americans. Um, and Billy identified with, uh, with Mexicans. He had a Mexican girlfriend, he learned to speak Spanish. He, he identified with the dispossessed having come from an immigrant mm -hmm. family. So he hated the rings, but I hadn't heard about the rings before. Mm -hmm. um, apparently they went to the top. Ulysses S. Grant, the, the president, was either in one of the rings or knew about them and allowed them to, to flourish. Um, it's probably not so dissimilar today. But anyway, I wanted... Um, the audience to be aware that this was the context in which Billy became an outlaw, that there were a lot of people who were much worse than Billy, but they wore respectable suits and they were rich and, uh, uh, you know, they were judges or, uh, you know, shop owners or whatever they were, <laughs> politicians. Uh, so that was one major thing. It was a sort of contextual thing. I mean, I love America. I, I studied American mm -hmm. society and literature for many years at universities. And, um, but I mean, America was then and still is a very violent, as we know only too well today, uh, yeah. very, very violent culture. Um, but w w when Billy was around, it was even worse, but the violence was orchestrated by these groups of rich, ruthless, white Americans. So I wanted to say that. And the other thing I really wanted to do was to help the audience love Billy as much as I love Billy. Um, and, and in a sense that was, I wanted to be as honest as I could be about who Billy was and what, he, what he'd done. Uh, but I also wanted to redeem him from the old tropes and cliches that seem to surround his name. Mm. So interesting, and especially like talking about the people in power who get to choose when violence is acceptable and when it isn't acceptable uh, is very interesting idea. Michael, to finish off, I just want to ask you, you said when you were a young uh, child, you really looked up and to Billy and loved playing Billy the Kid Guest. What do yeah. you think you as a child would think of the show, Billy the Kid, if you could go back in time and show him that show? Uh, well, for a start, I'd be very thrilled that, uh, you know, one of my heroes is on TV. I mean, when I was that age or even younger, my mum allowed me to stay up late sometimes to watch two things in particular, uh, American shows, and they were gangster shows or Westerns. There was a Clint Eastwood show on, I remember at the time, his first uh, <laughs> TV show. And, um, you know, there was a, gang there was a gangster uh, show as well. And I loved uh, 
America from afar, you know, in those days. And, and what I loved about the material, or without realizing why I loved it, was that it was so mythic. It, it was everything, or the whole, the stories that were told in these shows were, were, were big and mythic stories. And the West was a, a mythic, a wonderful mythic place. You know, Chicago was, was mythic. Um, and I still kind of feel uh, about America that, that, that way too. So I would, just as my mum let me get, get out of bed and run down uh, to watch The Untouchables or, you know, Clint Eastwood, and I, my heart would be pounding and I would watch it breathlessly the, the, the landscapes and the shootouts and the, um, it was so different from British drama you know, which is very parochial, very slow, usually about the royal family or something, you know. So uh, I would have been chuffed. I would have been so pleased that Billy was on the TV. Uh, well, Michael, um, all the best of luck with the upcoming Emmy Awards. I don't think there's a drama series about the royal family this year in contention. So, yeah, that might help you guys out. And we've got uh, people watching this interview can go to goldderby.com to make your own awards predictions and watch other interviews with award contenders. And, Michael, just thank you so much for giving us the time today. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. 